Good evening. Ooh. A few people joining and connecting to audio. Good evening. Hi, Rosa. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Anita. Hi, Casa. Sorry, I'm not going to be able to say hi to everyone, but I'll try as much as we, I can. I Miss Claire, Sue, Carol. My name is Stanford. Very, very welcome. We're going to give a few more minutes for people to just drop in and also to connect to their audio. So as I said, my name is Stanford. I'm a medical doctor who currently work in mental health, previously work in maternity, also a yoga teacher, also yoga therapy trainee, and uh, Colin, uh, who will introduce himself very, very shortly. Uh, behind the scene, we also, also have two lovely people monitoring the chat. Uh, Lauren and Paul, I'm sure they don't want to wave, uh, but they will monitor the chat the whole time. So if there's any problem at any point, please um, just pop into the chat. I encourage you to uh, put any question into the chat also, so we can maybe incorporate into the talk as well and you don't have to wait until the end. So Colin. Hi everyone my name's Colin. Um, I'm a yoga teacher, yoga therapist. Um, I spent the last 20 plus years working um, with people with various different conditions, different situations and I'm so happy to be here with Stanford who has chosen this evening's subject. It wasn't me that chose this. Um, we sat there. I remember was it, it was a pub wasn't it? It was a pub, and why is it always me? You it chose the pub. I didn't choose the pub, but you chose the pub. And so we, we sat there and we went through the alphabet. And I remember we sat there with a piece of paper and we got to E. And we decided to choose exercise. And I'm just thinking now, what on earth were we thinking about when we thought about yoga and exercise? So I'm going to hand over and ask the first question to you, Stanford. Um, just, just very quickly, if this is OK. Um, what, what is exercise? How do we define exercise? Wow, okay, we're starting easy, I can see. Uh, <laughs> so exercise, well, in a Western medical sense is anything that you're physically being active. So typically we say when your heart rate is going up, when your respiratory rate is going up, you're starting to sweat a little bit, rather you know, gently like wet patches or profusely, any of the above will be a physical exercise. So in short, you doesn't even have to be anything that you don't do normally. Cause if you, I mean, everyone walk all the time. If you walk a bit more briskly, that's exercise. Uh, some people live by the beach, live by the seaside, they swim, that ex exercise. Some people carry shoppings. And that, you know, if you carry it a lot, you walk for a long period of time, that can count as your exercise. That's actually within the NHS guideline. That's a mild to moderate exercise, so medium intensity. So from my point of view, uh, it's basically anything that kind of tap into your body a little bit more, exert yourself a little bit more, and in some way kind of challenge your bodies a little bit more. So that would be my definition. Colin, throwing back right back at you, what do you think exercise is? Or oh, actually going to be a better question, I hope. Why oh, do we exercise? Hang on, hang on. No, no, I prefer your first question. You can't just throw that other question in. I was expecting that other one come back. Um, so, you know, yoga is very, very interesting. What it does is it, it, they tend to think everything through and they put everything into categories. You know what we're like? We just kind of, we have a category and a label for absolutely everything. And we sort of have a list of stuff. So we put everything exercise-wise under the category of sharira, um, it means that which will eventually decompose. So it's, it's, it's working with the body. So it's anything that comes to work with the body. And we break that down into five different classifications. So we give those classifications as purposes to actually work with the body. The first one is kind of interesting. It's, it's to do with um, sharira rakshana. It's to, you're doing something with the body to maintain it, to protect it. So like you just mentioned, going for a walk. So you're using the body, you're maintaining the body, you're protecting the body, you're doing something to use it rather than lose it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you've got this one category and everything comes under that, which is, you know, to maintain and protect. So if you think about it, um, crikey. Like a strengthening resistant exercise? Um, so it can be strengthening, it could be resistance in exercise, but it could also be um, the sort of stuff that you do with regard to, let's say, as a child um, or as an adult. 
or sometimes later on in life as well. So there, there becomes different ideas of maintenance and protection in, you know, based on the person where they are in their life and what's going on. Does that make any sense? Yeah, so far so good. Okay, so this is the first category. Um, so the second category we've got is, is kind of interesting as well. It's, um, it's, to, it's to do with Shiria Samskara. It's to do with the understanding the pattern that the body has or laying down a new pattern for the body or working with the pattern of the body. So if you think about an exercise, what you're doing with an exercise is you've got the body and you then take this exercise and you actually put the exercise into the body to work with the pattern of the body. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, okay. What, what would be an example of this? Oh, um, yoga? Or something, yeah, yoga, something like swimming. So what you've got is you've got the person's body, you give them the exercise, you put it into the body to create a pattern and a habit for the body. So they kind of, this is the second classification. The third one is that actually what you can do is, is you've got Shirira Samskara Parinama. You can do it to change the pattern that the body has. So let's say what's happening is that someone has been sitting at their desk all day and they're hunched forward in this way. You would then put into them an exercise or something into them. So you get them to go for a long walk up a hill. You're actually changing the pattern of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's the third one. Fourth one. The fourth one is, um, I'm trying to remember them all. Um, <laughs> the fourth one is, is interesting. It's, it's um, Sharira Samyama. And, and this is an interesting area. It's, it's to do with the way that we learn about ourselves from doing the exercise. So it's more of a kind of like a, a psychological discovery, you know? So what happens is that, I don't know, do you, do you do any sports, Stanford? Not really, but a bit of climbing maybe. Okay, so a little bit of climbing. So first of all, what happens is that I get you in front of the climbing thing and you look up the top and you scrabble right the way up the top like this. And you sweat profusely and you think that was really good. I feel I've got lots of kind of tension in my body. Um, I've done it this way. And then someone comes along and says, well, hang on, you need three points of contact at any time. And, you know, if you press there and press there, you can reach for there. And so you start to understand how the body's working. You start to really get an understanding, a deeper understanding about how you can refine the way that you interact with your body. So this is the fourth category. Does that make sense? Yep, and I'm learning how to climb from you as well just now. Thank you. Um, and then we've got the fifth category, and the fifth category is called Shirira Chikitsa. It, it, it's, it's where we actually use the exercise for therapy. So in a way, let's say what's happening is I've got a guy down here who's um, he's just had a knee replacement, and what's happening is we, we've got little exercises, and we're doing lots of little exercises to help him with regard to his knee. So we're putting the exercises into his body, to help his knee. So yoga's got this interesting way that it kind of builds these sort of lists and it's got these five sort of lists and everything then comes out underneath these lists. So the first one um, is with regard to understanding the, or laying down a habit or a pattern into the body. So if you think about working with young children, and you give them sort of different exercises, you give them different things, suddenly what happens is they learn to overcome fear. They learn to um, you discover things, play games, have fun. So we lay down a pattern, we use the exercise to lay down a pattern into the body. And then we can use the exercise to change a pattern. So we can actually sort of turn around and in Sharira Samskara Parinama, what we can do is we can actually come to see the pattern someone's got within the body and then use the exercise or exercise regime to change that. So if you think about sometimes when there's a weakness in the body, you ask someone to go swimming, they use the exercise, it, it brings some coherence and strength to the body. Then we've got this idea with regard to Shura Rakshana, this idea of maintaining or protecting. And this is also interesting because when we start to look at the relationship that someone has with their body and how that changes over time, what we look at 
first of all, with regard to performance, suddenly changes into actually we've got to protect and we've got to maintain what we've got. So this idea of maintenance and protection is hugely interesting. Then we've also got this other idea um, of samyama, it's this idea of mastery of the body. So being able to understand more and more and more and actually start to understand or get to your potential, your optimum potential of what is possible within the use of your body. So for you climbing up the wall, suddenly discovering more and more and more how you can move faster, how you can move more agile and become more efficient and more effective within what you're doing. And then the final one we've got with regard to Chiquita therapy. So this kind of like sort of for me gives the sort of the purpose and the framework for working with the body and working with exercise. Can I ask a, another question? Do you mind? Go for it. I have a question. Um, Getting a little scared. Does, does exercise, should exercise change through someone's life? And what are the optimal exercises a person should do? Okay, another easy one, clearly. Um, so I'm, I'm going to copy you because you cheekily answer the first question, but at the same time, you kind of answer the second question in terms of yoga, why we exercise. I think that was a very broad view. I'm going to use the same example. I'm going to say, from my point of view, I gathered why we exercise from a Western sense, and hopefully that will ex answer that question in a way. So I think exercise a lot of the time comes in warm up or warm down. So like you do a bit of, you know, stretching, do a little bit of stepping, fast paced, getting warm up and also cool down at other uh, at the end of the uh, intense exercise. So hopefully that's important. Um, especially now in January, maybe, maybe a bit of weight control. This is partly why I picked this topic or we picked this topic in this month because I think this is very relevant. Most people's new year resolution tend to be around that for some reason. So also at the same time is about aesthetics, you know, how you look. Do you exercise so that you look better or you look a certain way? But at the same time, it, it kind of then further extends to some people exercise to compete. They want to win, especially, you know, you're in that swimming lane next to someone who looks professional in a very tiny speedo or whatever swimming costume that they're in and swimming cap, and you just want to beat them just a little bit more. Sometimes that's why we exercise ex as well. I definitely have those, you know, fellow swimmer next to me. I kind of just, I don't want to drown. Um, <laughs> and then there are, as you said, people who do it for maintenance. People get to a certain age, like say my mom's age, um, or sometimes recovery and rehabilitation. You want to maintain a certain amount of physical status or ability. And that's definitely that uh, side of it as well. And then there are the three main ones. I kind of le left them till the end because they are the big ones that we want to get to at some stage. Cardiovascular, aerobic. So these are the ones that, you know, you kind of moderately to sometimes slightly severely exert your body. So you're definitely sweating a bit more. You're definitely breathing a bit faster. You can feel your heartbeat. But at the same time, you're not got getting into that space where you can't quite speak just yet. You can still kind of speak in you know, a few broken sentences like I'm doing right now. Um, but these things are good because they increase your lung capacity, your cardiovascular function, definitely your heart and your muscles and your blood, um, arteries. So they're also really good at helping you to uh, regulate your blood pressure. If you have a bit of your regular heart rate, sometimes they can help a little bit. Uh, they also actually can build strength as well as reduce joint pain because they put stress onto your joint uh, and any stiffness. Sometimes they can help, obviously, sometimes they can exacerbate it. Uh, and in general, for your mood, it actually lift your mood a little bit because you exercise and you can kind of release that tension a little bit. And then there was the strengthening and resistant power uh, exercise. So these are slightly different. These literally actively adding um, stress onto your body, sometimes just so that like weight bearing, it helps your bones, helps your, um, your uh, ossification. So how your bones forming, how your bone is um, building and taking things away at the same time, because that's a constant cycle, it's constant turnout on your bone and you want them to keep building that strength because when we are old, unfortunately, we all lose bone mass masses and you want to make sure that happen. 
I can you build more strength, uh, more so compared to the other ones as well, which between the two means that you can be slightly more accident prone. Um, but at the same time, also it helps you to uh, get yourself into a slightly better mood because of endorphins. And the last one, which obviously is very, very uh, relevant, is flexibility and balance. So um, you can do that stationary, you can do it like reformer, Pilates, you can do it slightly mobile, you can do yogas. Um, these are ones that help you to increase the range of movement in your body. Uh, agility, you uh, make, it, make your body slightly more supple. Again, that's very useful, especially with the balancing, helps you to be more accident prone. Um, also, again, helps you to increase a little bit of circulation, especially if your body starts moving in a slightly bigger range, uh, you can increase overall circulation, not just the heart function, but actually the overall circulation like to your fingers, to your toes, or the extremities. And again, you release tension, especially locally, if there's any like local tension like in your back, in your legs, in your glutes, they are very good as well. So to answer your question, I think everyone should exercise, uh, but I think everyone's coming into exercise with a slightly different mindset one thing slightly different thing and as i always say i think what we want and what we need always changes constantly for our life life like you said when you're children you want to want them to grow a little bit more you want them to start you know facing that challenge every now and then physically as well as mentally knowing maybe even in competition what does it mean to lose yeah what does it mean to actually feel out of breath you want them to actually go through those stress and challenges when they're adults maybe it's time like say like my age now around 30 you want to them to do a little bit more stress test so we can really build that bone masses build that muscle masses because this is kind of like the peak time of our body and then later on as we are getting a little bit older you want to do maintenance maybe also you want to look aesthetically or make weight control perhaps because our metab metabolism is slightly lower, we should knock those out either. And especially when we're coming to older age, when we are slightly more stiff, we want to do a little bit more stretching. We want to do once again, slight amounts of weight bearing so we can keep our bone masses. So I think there is a natural progression, but that's just a natural progression according to human life cycle. What we want on top of that, as always, is going to be a little bit more complicated. Is that a good answer or is that a convoluted answer? No, I, I think what you've done very eloquently um, is that you have broken the human structure down into its systems and looking at the importance of maintaining those systems and also the importance of maintaining the structure. And I also think that what you've highlighted is something very, very important, which is actually each one of us is different, completely and utterly different. And I also love, again and again, the battle between what we want and what we need. And the idea of the patterns and habits that we have around exercise, especially when there are very different motivations involved or not involved within the process as well. So thank you for, for everything that you said. I've got just one question, um, if this is okay. Do you think, can yoga be exercise? Oh, so so you decided to throw me that question instead of answering that one on your own. Okay, well, uh, hang on. I, well, you, what you can do is you can you can actually find a friend, or you. I mean, you can you can <laughs> you. I have an idea. I have an idea. Let's not answer that question. Let's just pose that question to everyone now. I mean, can because because the thing is, it is can yoga be exercise, or can exercise be yoga? These are very, very different ideas, very, very different ideas and very interesting ideas, actually, because um, the more we start to understand about our relationship with the body, because this is what we're doing with exercises, we're understanding more about the relationship that we have with our body. We're actually looking to honour and respect our body. We're understanding how we interact with our body, how we sort of come to engage with the belief system that we have about how we need to maintain or protect or look after or do the activities that we come to do and how we enjoy those activities as well so there's kind of like a whole mix of stuff that's caught up in this but if we start to combine yoga and exercise together i think let's park this question to the end and jump to the end would that be okay 
Sound, sounds like a good idea. But I just want to pick up on uh, Della, I believe, uh, mentioned that lots of her clients come to her class as their GP recommended yoga. Uh, do you have similar experience, Colin? Of my GP recommending yoga? Or your student have been coming with GP recommendation or referral? Yes. Um, and in your opinion, what is that about? Is it about... Um, is it about the fact that we can go to somewhere, we can go to an environment where we can start to move our bodies, to start to actually feel our bodies, connect with our bodies, appreciate our bodies, have some success with our bodies, have some space with ourselves, to be able to breathe, to start to put into our bodies breathing and gentle movement, which doesn't which changes the pattern, the underlying pattern of push and stress that's in the system. Because this is also one of the benefits of, of doing exercise is that it comes to remove, like you mentioned, tensions within the body. It reduces stress, it reduces tension. So yes, there's a lot of people that I find that do come because of a huge amount of t stress or tension within the system. Um, so I think that there was a question in there. Um, my answer, first part will be, I think if they came to your class, they would get the benefit that you just described. So agree. Um, I personally have been through different classes where the room's heated, where the sequence are a lot faster. So the stress on your body is not mild and the connection to the body sometime may not have as much space as we hope. Because I, I, I also learned from yourself that, you know, that, that space needs to be cultivated instead of push, if that's the right word. Um, so I think, I think, yes, there is definitely space and room for what you have described. But at the same time, it depends on what class and which studio system or school that they ascribe to. Um, I would have to be slightly controversial and say the GP recommendation probably has a lot to do with fashion. You know, if it's 20 years ago, it probably was swimming, maybe also a bit of marathon running, because at the time there's all the hype. And back in, I think, is it the 70s? There's all the aerobics and Pilates were high at one point. So kind of exercise kind of go through phases. And sometimes I think GP recommendation comes because yoga has been really big on the news articles, on celebrities' mouths, on social media like Instagram and that's why where a lot of the recommendation comes because a lot of people have benefited greatly. However, the recommendation may not be from a personal experience or recommendation. That would be my sense of feeling sometime. Part of that comes from, I know a lot of my co uh, previous colleagues, as I said, I worked in maternity before, they will have recommended to new moms pregnancy yoga. But I have because personally work with a lot of my colleagues, a lot of them don't really understand what pregnancy yoga really entails, like what do they actually go through, how many different schools of pregnancy yoga there are. So uh, trying to be fair to everyone's, um, I think sometimes word of mouth and sometimes because in fashion, sometimes actually people have uh, true experience about that. Um, from a medical point of view, I think um, we recommend yoga because Yes, once there's a space for your mental health to um, have a bit of release, especially that tension, especially that cultivation of contentment, maybe some people that mean happiness. At the end of the day, most yoga school is very good uh, on physically helping you with the balancing, with the stretching, but also a little bit of that like resistance and strengthening exercise because we actively use our own body weight in a lot of the posture. And no matter how much you weigh, that is enough stress on your body most of the time. So I think from Western point of view, that's probably what happened. Thank you. Do you see, um, as, a, as a doctor, do you see cases of, uh, and what spectrum do you see with regard to people exercising? Do you see over-exercise, under-exercise? How much exercise do you feel is needed? 
because there's a recommended thing, and, and I love the myth about the 10,000 steps. Do you like the 10,000 steps myth? And you know where that's yes. coming from? Yeah. Yes. I don't like it, but yes, I'm aware of it. Yeah. So, so there's this kind of like, there's this, you know, how much exercise? Um, because we're dealing with individual people, and I know that if I go for a walk, you know, I, I actually, I walk and I, I drag the dogs behind me up a hill, you know, so I'm like that. And the dogs are kind of like, really, do we have to go up a hill? So, you know, each person has got their own way of engaging with exercise, but what, what's too much and what's too little? What are the effects of too much? What are the effects of too little? And how do we get it just right? And I don't know. It's just a, it's just a beginning to open this question because I, I I'd like to talk about this as well. But maybe I'll ask it to you first, and then we I can talk about it afterwards. Would that be okay? Okay, I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Um, so I think that's like about three part question here. So I'll try as much as I can. So um, so the NHS recommended uh, amount for everyone per week it will be more than 150 minutes, which means two and a half hours of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. So this is not like your HIIT class where it's high intensity, short interval in between, uh, or a mixture of both. So that's the recommended amount. Um, I have to say most of the time, if I see my patient, it tends to be either end of the spectrum, either they are over-exercising or they're under-exercising. If they are doing just right, I mean, you, you can appreciate they tend not to come into the doctor's office, which is kind of duh. Um, and the reason I personally don't like the thousand step myth is because I'm very active. I don't have a Fitbit or, you know, any of those machines. I mean, I think my phone probably automatically track me everywhere anyway, but I rarely look at it. Uh, I think most days I'll actually pass that a thousand steps mark. However, I'm sure everyone will nod their head when I say that we all have those days. We just want to be lazy on the couch, just rest have a bowl of stew and an ice cream. And for those days when I'm feeling like that and I have to drag myself like Colin's dog all around for a thousand steps, I think I probably feel miserable because that's my rest day. So that's why I say that is a myth that I don't like. I very much want to work the way that my body wants to work because I think it's slightly more cleverer than I am. And most of the time I'm active and sometimes I just need to be more passive. Handing back to you, Colin. Thank you. Um, I spoke to someone last week um, and he said to me, do you have any yoga practice and yoga positions to help my knee? And I said, well, can you explain what's happened? And uh, he said, well, I'm doing this sort of three online classes a day. And I'm also going for a run. And he goes, and my knee's in absolute agony. And he said, I've just been for a run just now. And I'm in so much pain. He said, it's swollen. I can't do anything. And I want to, and I've got three more of these classes to do tomorrow because I'm doing this challenge. So as I'm sitting talking to him, I'm Firstly, I'm doing a number of different things. I'm trying to understand how he's doing the activities that he's doing in the first place and how those activities are affecting his structure. Because he's, you know, he wants to do this. He's, he's driven to do this. He's doing three of these a day. He's, he's kind of, for me, he's going just quite a bit too much. And he's doing these big runs as well. So I start to ask him lots of questions. I start to say to him, you know, can you tell me just a little bit more, you know, why are you doing this? He's like, well, you know, I really want to get fit. I said, but you're, you're very, you, you know, you look fit, you look really, really good. Well, no, you know, I want to get fit. I want to actually understand my optimal potential. So I'm working with this and I'm working with my diet as well. So I start talking to him a little bit more and sort of say, well, can you tell me about the, these kind of classes you're doing, what you're doing? He goes, a lot of them are squatting down and jumping up, squatting down and jumping up, squatting down and jumping up. So you're doing this squatting down, jumping up activity, and you're also running as well. Yeah. And can you just mind me just walking around the room and just showing me how you're running? So I start to see him move. 
And I realized that he's, in a way, his willpower and his mind are very, very strong, incredibly strong. But there's a sort of disconnect with the body. He, he's not understanding how he's coming to work with his body. He's pushing his body, almost dragging his body behind him. Do you know what I mean by that? So his mind is very strong and it's like his mind is off kind of going, go on, let's go. And his body is like the dog, you know, my dogs behind me just kind of going, really, do we have to go up this hill again? And, and just bouncing along right the way behind. And I see quite a bit of this with regard to people's interaction with exercise. And for me, this is where yoga comes in because we start to, we've got to create a lot of steps. A lot of steps of awareness with regard to how the person is interacting in such an extreme way and the psychology of why they're acting in such an extreme way with their body. And we have to pose a number of different questions and give a number of different tasks, a number of different ideas in order to move a person from this type of extreme thing where actually pain, as we've discussed before, is your body trying to tell you something. Your body is kind of going, Ow. Ow. and it's doing this and you're going shut up we're going to do three more of these classes and we're going to write this here and your body doesn't have the same kind of negotiation tactics as you know other people do it kind of goes i'm going to collapse i'm going to burn out i'm going to break and and so it kind of kicks in with a number of these different things and so for me the job here within yoga is to take someone from this point and begin to move them to a point where there's actually much more respect for their body where they actually make friends with their body so actually their body and then they become friends does this make any sense Dan? do you have any um yes I, that makes a lot of sense and that actually made me think of a question i wanted to ask you so i'm going to throw it straight to you now um what does getting stronger mean for exercise for you i know my answer i'll share afterward but i want you to I want you to share your view if that's okay what does it mean to be getting stronger in exercises it's a very interesting thing um for us it's linked to confidence and so the exercise the approach is one where one starts to understand one's confidence because strength and courage are a deep thing with inside of oneself that comes from the development of confidence. Very nice. So I, I asked that question because I, exactly what you share earlier, I always ponder when students or patients or clients come to me as a doctor or as a yoga teacher and they say I just want to get stronger like what does that actually mean obviously for most people who go to gym it means bigger muscles but I know if there are a few medical colleagues here so I think you can share your views as well but I, I think from a medical point of view that means hypertrophy so the muscle actually gone through something called hypertrophy where it gained in mass but it's actually abnormal. We're abnormally increasing mass into the muscle. So actually in some way that's not stronger, that, that is making it functioning abnormally. Does it mean lifting more weight? Like, you know, you can bench, I don't know, I don't go to the gym, so I can't give you a pounds, but you know, 200 pounds per se. But what does that mean? And for me, in some way that's not getting stronger either because why would I need to walk around with 200 pounds to begin with? Like that's not, really feasible nowadays maybe back in the old days where manual work is a lot more everyday thing that maybe means stronger so you can carry out your everyday tasks much better whilst nowadays you know our bag is I don't know five kilo that is even too much in my eyes um does it mean running longer distance again I would question why where, where are you going to like why, why are you constantly running what was the purpose of running that um thank you Roberta uh what's the purpose of running that far so I think I worked out for my personal answer, which in some way linked to Collins, is to get more coordinated with my body. I think I don't need to get 
stronger in terms of amounts of strength or power. I just need to be able to access the different parts of my body a little bit more equally. And I think Colin, as always, work a little bit deeper on the same message, which is it's also in, including your mind, so confidence, your courage, you have to go a little bit deeper, you have to actually link that part of yourself. I think, I think that's just really, really beautiful. So thank you. Thank you for the, the, for the yeah, thank you for the question as well. Um, because it, it does, it poses a number of things, it poses, a lot of questions about why, what motivates someone to actually do something? Um, what motivates someone to increase mass? And does that actually make them feel good about themselves? So what's the, what, 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 you know, what underlying is the motivation to do something or not to do something? Because in the opposite direction, I saw, a guy last, yeah, last week for the first time. And he just, he said, I'm exhausted, I can't do anything at all. I'm so low, I'm so depressed. I just want to lie down. And so all he wanted to do was just lie down on the mat. He said, I just want to lie down here. I just want to lie down and just, that you are there and you can support me. And in one way, he's got this heaviness, you know, he's really sort of, he's, he's like, oh, I'm just, I just, you know, I can't do it. I can't go out. I can't do this. I can't do that. And to get someone from that point where they're lying down and get them to start to do some kind of movement in their body, to start to actually look at the small and gradual steps to take in order for someone to move from a place to re-mobilize themselves, to restore both strength, flexibility and confidence becomes hugely important because it has to be done in small steps. And so in one way, when we're working to with excess, and also when we're working with not enough use, both have to be done with small steps, such small steps that we start to bring back in both instances, confidence in oneself and in one's body. So it's like we're in both ways, we're moving towards a center. Um, so for me, when I'm, when I'm working with people, this is what I'm looking at, is I'm looking at whether, what, you know, what do they use normally what do they use to excess what do they underuse what's their body saying what activities do they do how does those activities affect their lifestyle what what things do they do in their lifestyle um but above all i'm looking at within yoga i'm looking at the psychological attitude i'm coming to look at how they view the relationship with themselves and also the relationship they have outside with the world and how they use their body and how they respect their body and how they trust their body. So I'm looking at these things and how this then affects the confidence they have within themselves, whether they hide behind the body or whether they actually, you know, have a good healthy relationship with it. And what I also see with the body is that the body, by observing the body and how someone uses their body, it shows you everything about how they think and interact with themselves and other people because the body itself takes patterning when they do certain things and you, you, it shows you a lot of the underlying patterning they have yeah i sorry your your comments has always let me think so much so it makes me think because i think in western medicine there's this saying any is better than none, which I think I agree. However, there's also the saying, the more the better or the more the merrier, which I, I think maybe we may have used it on the social media because I don't personally quite agree because there's almost this tendency of going that just a little bit further, just that little bit more, um, you know, that little bit better, whatever better or more means. 
And that's sometimes when, you know, injuries and torn ligaments and muscles or sprained ankles results, or at least in my, in my own personal situation, this is clearly, I'm quoting myself. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, again, keep on to your train of thought, Colin. Um, so you're talking about how exercise shows us our pattern, how we interact ourselves and the world. Now in lockdown, how has that interaction changed and what kind of pattern, if you don't mind sharing, have you been observing? Because I, I would say from my point of view first, so you can you have some time to think about it. I ask because I observe and talk to a few of my students and again, myself included. I partially torn uh, my right hamstring again. I twisted my ankle twice. <laughs> I kind of like sprang my wrist a little bit. And I definitely, you know, done something in the torso as well. So that there's a list of something. And I think during the lockdown, because everyone's at home, I'm not sure if it's because we have more time. Is it because, um, I don't know, because there's just so much choice out there. The teacher that I've always wanted to practice with who moved to Ireland four months ago, I can finally reconnect. There's almost this sense of urgency, again, at least in me, that you want to do a little bit more. And I, I, I think, oh, uh, in, on average, I've seen a lot more injury happens in most of my classes. But did you see the same thing will be question number one. And what will be the interaction is going to be my question number two. So I, I haven't seen any more injury from my classes or groups or people. But what I've seen is a, a change in psychology. Um, so what I have seen is I've I've seen over three lockdowns um, a change from embracing and positivity in one way. So at the very start, if I remember rightly, you know, lots of good intentions, you know, I'm going to get out, walk once a day, you know, put structures in place. Um, I've seen lots of changes with regard to, and, and particularly with regard to how, when all of the distractions have been removed, such as going to play tennis or going to play squash or going to go for a run or having the chance to do team activities or meet other people to do activities, those things being removed, how suddenly those distractions have left people in a much more difficult place. So it's, that's one of the sort of main things that I've seen. I don't know if that makes any sense, Stanford. Yeah, it does. And I think, again, I think from my personal experience, having not have that human contact in during the physical exercise is quite important as well, because I think, in the class, when there's someone physically there instructing, sometimes a bit easier to pick up whatever has been done too much and whatever has been done too little mm -hmm. and what is just right. I think through the screen, at least from my own experience, is definitely a lot harder. And I think also, yeah, it's, it's that connection that you lack as well. Mm -hmm. Did I tell you the story um, of horses and running? And no, I think you're about to. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember many, many years ago, we were discussing exercise and sort of training and running and yoga. And I remember Desika Char saying, he said, um, my father used to say that horses are the only things that should run and human beings are the, uh, should walk. And I had quite a lot of difficulty around this because I, I ran a marathon at that time and I used to love running and training. And I always thought, well, that doesn't sit very well with me. It really doesn't sit well with me. Does that just make any sense, Sanford? Yes and no, because I hate running. I've seen an Instagram picture of you on a running machine, so don't even try that. 
Yeah, that's why I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so where am I going with this? It's take me a number of years to unravel it. To unravel the my resistance to what was being said and to understand what was actually being said within this. And horses are quite interesting. As you know, I ride a horse, Stanford. Um, and I also walk. And it was only when I really in the last sort of three, four years of getting on the, this horse on a regular basis that I began to understand exactly, exactly what my teacher meant. Now, within a, with a horse, when you get on a horse, you have to be in charge. You are the one that's in charge completely and utterly. If not, what happens is the horse runs off at you, the horse bucks and throws you off, the horse actually plays lots of silly games with you. Um, it sounds, why am I mentioning this right now? It, it means that in yoga, the horse is your sense and is your mind. It's your senses with regard to your smell, your sight, your taste, your touch, how you come to use your arms, your legs, how you use the whole of your body. This is how it's referred to as a horse. And it means that running is for horses. It means that running is actually for your senses. It's there. So exercise is really helpful for your senses and for your mind. And walking, walking for the whole being, walking is the time that you can have some space, that you can actually observe many, many things rather than actually having to be really on something very specifically. Does this make any sense? It, it does. And I'm reflecting to my own example. So I saw a fellow non-runner as well um, on the chat. Uh, I personally don't run because if I run, as you said, I, I lost that connection uh, to the senses because mainly it's my knee is my weak spots. So I, my, my relationship between the motion of running, the pavement and my knee is just not going to work. And I end up focusing on the pain and nothing else at all. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it's also fair that actually sometimes running is okay for some people because to, I think it's about time, so we should probably bring it back to your earlier question. I think there is also saying that for some people, especially like a marathon runner, they actually run so much that they mentally got into a state where, I don't know if, if I'm using the Sanskrit term correctly, like samadhi, where you are really fully integrated into your own body, into your mental state. So like people achieve that. Again, can all exercise be yoga? Because some people may achieve that by swimming. They may achieve by doing another form of activities, not, you know, asana, uh, posture trainings. So I think it is possible. And maybe sometimes running is also good for some people, just not people like me who have weak knees. So the, the question at the beginning, um, the question at the beginning, can, can yoga be exercise? Or can exercise be yoga? It means that we, do, firstly we define yoga and we can define yoga in many different ways, if this is okay. Is it okay if I just do Please that? keep going. So you can define yoga in, in, in many different ways. And um, if we define it with regard to activity, it's defined as in Bhagavad Gita, yo, chapter 250 um yoga is skill in action so it's defined as yoga being skill in action so it means that there is a point that one has got to within the action that one is doing that is so skillful that it, it, it is described as yoga and yoga itself is is it, it's a capacity to it, to link it means numbers of different things. It means in the Amarokosha, the, it gives 
which is the, the oldest dictionary, it gives dhyana meditation as being a definition of yoga. It gives the definition yukti, which is intelligent steps as defining what yoga is. Sangati, it brings things together. Is it like a coming together or something? It's like, like your mind is being sort of dispersed and suddenly it just goes, boom, it brings it together in this way. Um, upanam, it, 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 it's, it's upaya, sorry, effort. So it's a very strong effort involved and a means to doing something. So for me, it, it's the, can exercise be yoga? Yes, at a level, it definitely can. There becomes a point where it moves from being unskillful to being skillful, that it becomes yoga. And in the opposite way, can yoga be exercise? I think it, it, it isn't yoga yet. Fair enough. I, I think after taking classes and training with you and of course some other good yoga teachers as well, I would agree. Um, yoga at the moment has been taken a lot of the time as exercise. Um, but it should be deeper, that there, there, there are more layers to it. It's not just mentally, but I think philosophically, or maybe that's a way of life for some people. Um, and if you only take it as exercise, maybe the name's called yoga, but the, the action and the intention may, may not align would be, align would be my answer. Um, do you have any more questions for me, Colin? <laughs> I feel like there's one bubbling up somewhere. Yeah, there is. I mean, I because I'm I, I'm I, I'm I'm fascinated with with the different possibilities of of use of the body and how you know there's so much sort of research with regard to exercise and how people use their bodies and which is the best form of exercise and some people say it's walking, other people say swimming. We would say it's you know, breathing is the best for the for the body and, you know, maintaining a coherence of the movement of everything within the body. I'm just wondering, you know, that there's activities that you come to, you know, you can, you can do it at a particular time of your life that you can't do later on in your life. Um, there's activities that wear the body up very, very quickly. I know that, you know, dancers, I know so many dancers who have had so many joint replacements, um, you know, so there's, for me, there's lots of all these different activities. Are there, are there some activities that you would recommend over other activities or which are the worst activities for the body that you've come across? Is there any sort of, because you're very good at amazing facts and I, you know, you discover some incredible, I love that facial expression when you do that. That means you've got something up your sleeve. I know you. Um, yeah, that one. <laughs> so are there any, are there any, is there anything that I, I think that what I'm trying to say is that you, anything that you feel that we need to know about with regard to exercise, because it, it's, it is very personal and, yeah. So um, I love it when you challenge me like that, because I don't have that amazing fact um, written down on my sheets, so I'm going to have to think about it in my head. So I think the first one that comes to mind would be a repetitive, overly repetitive movement. So you were amazing saying that, you know, dancers, definitely one category, but I will arguably say some schools of yoga teacher also is the same, you know, have to see a lot of shoulders, hip replacement, uh, saying go for certain uh, gymnasts and people who go to gym and work out a lot. I think, or cyclists or, or marathon runner, um, when you work your body in such a repetitive way, or quoting Colin, in such a repetitive pattern, it kind of grinds and wear the joints as well as the muscles and the ligaments down. So instead of making them stronger, whatever that means, it actually kind of eroding its natural structures. 
And those are the times that is really um, bad because over time, those joints are going to get inflamed or the ligament is going to get more calcified. So is the muscle circulation is not going to go. So you're going to have more pain and stiffness. So that would definitely be one category that I can think of straight away. Uh, speaking of another one, I'm going to say to uh, I'm going to quote a friend of mine who years ago encouraged me to do a triathlon as well as a marathon um, training, which I firmly declined, um, not just because of my knee, but also I just don't ever want to. Um, but I said, you know, when I cycle for too long, actually my knee acts up and it's painful. And she would say, yes, that is normal. You just keep going, you push through the pain and you keep training and then you will get stronger. I was like, but my body is warning me with the pain. That is my way, my body's way of communicating to me saying that you need to stop. You know, you are doing way too much. And um, I think that would be another category. You know, a lot of the time in whatever forms of exercise, I would say is not just strengthening, it's not just cardiovascular, but also in stretching um, in many forms of exercise. If you've done too much when your body is already interacting with you, giving you those signals to stop and you're unwilling to listen or unable to listen to some people, that's that category as well. I think that is when injury will really happen. So you are overexerting yourself. And sometimes it's that competitiveness as well. Someone else is doing it. They disregard where they actually come from. You know, I've been sitting at home for the last three, four, five months because of whatever reason, maybe lockdown. And then I forgot about that. And then, oh, someone's doing an amazing king pigeon pose in the yoga class. Let's try that. And ouch, I think, I think that will be the third one is when when you kind of disconnect from yourself so much, you forgot where you're starting from and you just want to jump straight to 100 or 120 percent. And that's usually what I see. Is that good enough answer? It's brilliant because what it is, is it's saying that that actually we need to work in small steps, really small steps. So it's a, it's a little like rather than doing three hours on one day and then nothing for the rest of the week it's better to do you know 30 minutes each day and take a day off it, it's so there's got to be there's a consistency there but there's also a respect with regard to who you are and who the body is and what the body is and the state the body's in the reality of where the body actually is what's possible so there needs to be also an awareness with regard to the effect of what's happening and if what's happening is that you've done an activity and you get out of bed the next morning you fall on the floor and can't walk then it, it it's telling you what you've done with that activity and to continue it how does one continue it how does one step forwards so that one begins to get more awareness of the body, one doesn't repeat the same things again and again. So if what's happening is that you spend all day, and I met this guy, he spends all day sitting, and then he does cycling. And because he sits and he cycles in exactly the same way, he had the back problems and hip problems, so he was fit but he was and so it, it, it meant that what we have to do is look at the exercise that one is putting into the body by understanding what's happening you know what's the what's the person doing what what's going on within the body yeah. so and so we're looking at small steps and, and I, I see this quite a lot when I work with people who are recovering from a serious illness so Quite often in, in the cancer side of things, when someone's gone through chemotherapy or something, it, it, what you'll find is that suddenly there's a, a huge loss of energy and then the energy starts to come back again. And so they go out for a walk. So they're walking for five minutes around the house and then they'll get up and go, I feel much better. And they go out for an hour walk and come back and then they collapse. And the next day they're actually exhausted, the day after exhausted, day after day after exhausted, day after day after exhausted. And it goes back again, it comes back and they go around the house for five minutes and then they go out, they feel better, they go out for an hour walk again, come back and they collapse back down again. Does that make any sense? 
we're, we're, we're the strangest creatures because there's there's something that's doing something and what it is is it it's like i want to get back to where i was and if you remove the example i've given out of the way the cancer example and put it to everyone is that we've got an idea in our head about who we want to be based on the exercise that we're doing and almost in a way we probably need to look the other way around and look at us and what we're capable of doing and ebb and flow expand and contract based on what's going on in our lives and again i find this a lot with people with yoga practice as well someone just says you know i've got an hour and a half of yoga practice in the morning okay great and they'll have an hour and a half in, for yoga practice in the morning once a month and the rest of the time they spend their day you know beating themselves up because they actually couldn't do the yoga practice so the idea of achievable and sustainable and building and expanding and contracting becomes very important and this expansion and contraction means that what happens is sometimes you get up and the best place laid plans are kind of like you open the windows and you kind of go i'm gonna go running and you look outside and a four foot of snow's come and you kind of go okay i'm gonna go play in the snow instead so it, it means that this needs to happen in order for there to be exercise there's got to be for me evolution and consistency and like you mentioned with regard to what strength is is there has to be it has to move along to build one's confidence in a real way a genuine way yeah i absolutely agree and i think almost you kind of answer heidi's questions is every exercise suitable for everybody uh again i can only answer from my personal experience was i think by now you all know that i will point blank refuse to cycle or run for three hours i'm more than happy to cycle maybe half an hour just to get to work or go but i get by um, as a commute and be happily run for the bus or if i'm late for work i think i think there is a depends on what you're doing the exercise for if you're doing it for just cause then um, maybe they are not for everyone. However, I think if you moderately see why you're doing this exercise and what is your limit and how far you can take it and how you can modify it for your body, I think every exercise can be suitable for everybody. But it, it, it does require some understanding of your own body to begin with. Colin, is that fair? I think it is, it is fair. It's, I, I also see it as an opportunity for discovery a huge opportunity for discovery, um, an opportunity for to learn something about yourself that you haven't learned before each time you do it. So rather than put some ear pods in and just do the exercise because you want to disconnect, but actually to discover something about yourself as part of the exercise, I think is is for me the goal. This is Shura Samyama. Yep. And I think it's about time. So I'm like kind of coming to my ending conclusion. At the same time, I'm going to give you time to think about your one liner. So I think this time I'm going to be cheeky instead of coming up with my own. I'm going to kind of borrow something that I watched from TV and um, a TV series, uh, American series called Feud. Um, I think you'll pick up our pattern now. Colin actually brings real life example. I bring TV series. Um, so mine is actually called um, At Your Age, You Need to Worry About Staying Healthy, Not Staying Photogenic. Um, well, that is actually talking to the actress Joan Crawford when she's like 60s, 70s about, you know, she always trying to make herself pretty and, you know, do things to make herself pretty. I think it's actually quite applicable to everyone. I think one of the things is if you are always exercising or actually linking to what we said last time in the last webinar, eating things so you look better, maybe the focus should be on is it actually beneficial and contributing to your health and do you feel better afterward? Does it work? in your life a little bit more. I think that would be my ending remark. <laughs> Colin? Mine is to um, thank you, Stanford. I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you've given us today. I've really appreciated it. Um, the only thing I'd like to say and leave you guys with is, is to reflect on 
the fact that it's horses that run and humans that walk. And it took me years and years and years to understand it. And I hopefully, if you guys are probably much, much faster than me, um, and I mean much faster than me, I mean it took me about 20 years. So it, 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 it's a very interesting idea because then you're in charge, if that makes any sense. Um, so thank you so much for everyone coming today. Um, I think we meet in a few weeks time, three weeks time. And I, again, we, there we were sitting in this room and Stanford's got A, B, C, D, E, F, G written down. And he's like, well, what, what medical things are we going through? All these different things. And, and you get to, we got to E and he was like, exercise. And we get to F and, and, it, and it wasn't my idea. I promise you. Hey, <laughs> so you liked it. I, I thought it was hilarious, but that's because I've got a stupid mind, but flatulence. Okay, so we are going to discuss, we're going to spend an hour talking about flatulence next time we meet. I cannot believe that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be funny. Okay. Yeah, exactly. 16th of February, 7 p.m. Yeah. We're going to talk about gas and how it comes from, where it's going to. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so I, I can't wait. Me neither. <laughs> I'm going to hold it until then. Good night. Thank you so much for coming. Lovely to see you all. Take care, guys. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>